Christian, I talked about the tension between truth and grace. How many of you remember? You know, there's this tension, and, the, and when I say tension, there's all kinds of battles that 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 believers do. You know, it's a, you know, when you're not a Christian and you come into a Christian church, it's a little awkward. How many of you remember not being a Christian? Anybody here? Does anybody remember not being a Christian and going to a Christian church? It's like, wow, that was kind of weird. You know, like I was thinking, you know, if a non-believer came to this service, if you're here today, you might be here. And and you came to this service and, you know, here's a bunch of people that start clapping and singing. And, you know, some people are, you know, praying in the spirit. And you're looking around going, what in the world is that going on? You know, it's, it's kind of an awkward thing. Now, once you become a Christian and you become assimilated into the body of Christ, then it becomes very normal and, 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 and there's no problems with it. But until then, there's always this kind of awkward tension. And you know there's different kinds of churches. 
Yes. Say what? There's different kinds of churches. Some churches are very stoic. I mean, just the fact that you would have drums and guitars and music and keyboards. It's like, is this a nightclub or a church? <laughs> to be very honest, some people were raised and very, okay, now let's pray. Shh, shh, shh. And it's very quiet and very stoic. And, 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 and so there's all kinds, just like there's all kinds of different people. There's all kinds of different Christians. And so when I ask the question, what is a Christian? Last time I was talking about truth and grace and, and the mix. We talked about the woman at the well. We talked about Matthew, the tax collector. We talked about all these sinners that, that Jesus came to touch and uh, the thief on the cross. We, we talked about all of that. I want to I wanna talk a little bit more on what is a Christian today. And as I share this with you, um, I, want to, I want to say this, is that sometimes some of the meanest people I have ever met have been Christians. I say this very often because I, I, I preach in lots of different churches. And sometimes I go and preach in churches and I leave and I think, I wouldn't go to that church. You know why? Because sometimes churches are filled with mean people. They're, they're just mean. They're, they have they have an attitude. I, I didn't know them. It's like, hi, how, how are you? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. I, I don't really know. Now, here at Calvary, this is the thing that you got to understand is that uh, I, 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 I met David and Patricia. Uh, they, they came last week. They're just new in Hong Kong coming from Canada, and, and I said, you know, around Calvary, we have a saying, if you don't have a church home, welcome home. See, because home is a place where you let your hair down. Isn't it? Yeah. You're all looking at me like that. It's where you kick your shoes off, and you're comfortable, and, 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 and home, is, home is where you do life. And so, so this is kind of a place where we, we do life, and, and sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes it don't always make sense. See, because a church is a body. And God places people within the body as it pleases Him and in what God wants to do in our midst. But if you was to ask, if I was to run around here and ask 10 different people or 20 different people, what is a Christian? You know the amazing thing is? I would get 10 different answers. Well, what's a Christian? If somebody walked up to you on a street and says, are you a Christian? Some of you would go, uh, what? yes. Some would go, well, what do you mean? Some would go, well, I, I, I am, but not like them. <laughs> True? Because, you know, there's all kinds of different Christians. And so I think we sometimes we got to just kind of talk about it and, and, and throw it out there. Because some of you became a Christian because you said a prayer somewhere in your life. Not so much by transformation. It was just by, by a prayer. You, somebody said, you say this prayer. You said this prayer. And so now ever since you said that prayer, you told everybody, well, I'm a Christian because I said a prayer. Some feel like they're Christian because of baptism. When they were a baby, their parents had them baptized in water. So their whole life, they've been telling everybody that they're a member of a church because they were baptized when they were a baby. See, now I'm getting a little sensitive. Now, now you can feel it, because a lot of you were baptized as babies. And you're going, oh, okay, now, what, what, what's he talking about? What, what does he mean? Some of you, some of you went through, a, uh, you were a part of the church that at a certain age, you went through a thing called confirmation. And when you were confirmed, then you were established. And so your whole life, you're, you've been got this, well, what a Christian is, is well, when you get to a certain age, you go through these classes, and then you get this thing, and you get a certificate, and I was confirmed when I was. And so, well, is it the prayer? 
Is it the baptism? Is it, is it the confirmation? Well, it could be all. Or it could be none of it. Why? How can that be? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of you are taught and uh, or raised in a church that you were you were told that your brand of Christianity was the only correct brand. Whether that was you know some people were raised in the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is the only right church. Some were raised in a Protestant church. The only right church is a Protestant church or a Methodist church or a Baptist church. How can there be so many churches? And are they all right? Or worse, are they all wrong? <laughs> what can this mean? Well, somewhere in life, you and I, we, we've got to figure this out. We've got to figure out what it is. See, some people... I've met a lot of people that say, well, I was a Christian. Like, well, what do you mean you, you, you was a Christian? What, I, I don't understand what you mean by that. Well, what they, they'll tell you is, well, I was raised in church. My parents made me go to, how many had parents made you go to church? Okay, all right. So, so, so you, they made you. They went to church. That was their tradition. So that was your tradition. And you went. And they made you go. But soon as you were old enough to make your own decisions, you stopped going. Yeah. Yeah. Say, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm an adult now. I don't have to do what, my, my, what everybody else wants me to do, especially my parents. So therefore... I have made a decision. I'm not going to go. So I was a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And then some people will say there's no such thing as once a Christian. There's no such thing as once a Christian. Because once a Christian, always a Christian. You can't be a once a Christian. And now we're getting into all kinds of doctrinal arguments that the church gets into. There's no such thing. Because some people were taught that once you were a Christian, you became a Christian, you were always a Christian, and then some people were taught that you're a Christian, but if you sin, now you're not a Christian no more. How does that work? Does sin get into heaven? Is God holy? Yeah. <laughs> Does He allow sin next to holiness? No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. See, and and here's where churches get into all kinds of divisions. This is where Christians can get into all kinds of arguments, and this is what can stop a church from growing. And see, churches to stay alive need to grow. You got to grow. And to grow means you're reproducing yourself. See, see, when you have a baby and you bring a baby home and that baby's only this tall, you're really happy. Oh, good little, little baby. See, but if this baby is now 10 years old and only this tall, you're worried. Because this baby should be evolving. It should be growing. And so this is what churches do. But when churches grow, it's a painful thing. Because, see, when it's small, you're the most important element of it. As it gets larger, then more people are important. And pretty soon, if you're not careful, you can get lost in the mix of it. So what's a Christian? How many of you remember being 16 years old? For some of you, it's a long stretch, I know. <laughs> you remember being 16 years old and going out and going out with that person that was not a believer at 16 and doing things that you shouldn't have been doing? And some of you are going, I ain't copping to nothing. I'm just sitting right here. I'm just listening to this. I'm, I'm not, you know. You, you drove home really slow because you knew that if you was, or, or you were praying on, on, on the train going home, hoping that there was no wreck 
because you knew you'd break hell wide open and when you got home you you got on your knees and said god i'm sorry i'll never do it again i'm i'm back god i'm back i'm so far back i'm i'm in i'm, I'm, in. I'm all the way in and sometimes we can live in this constant state of well am i or aren't i some of you have been sitting you, some of you have become a christian 3000 times <laughs> you prayed the prayer god i'm so sorry i'll never do it again i'm all in again <laughs> And you know what? We can all relate to that. Yes. You know why? Because we've all been good guys and we've all been bad guys. We've all had good days and we've all had some bad days in our lives. <clears throat> For a lot of people, Christianity is all about a belief system. And what I mean by that, Christianity is about a doctrine. If you have sound doctrine, then therefore your doctrine is good, therefore you are good. Other people say it doesn't matter what your doctrine is if you don't have behavior to back that doctrine up. What good is truth that you do not live? And then there's a group of people out there that just hates Christians altogether. There's a group of people that, that, that think they're Christians and are just judgmental, homophobic moralists who think they're the only ones going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. Have you ever met a Christian like this? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> see, see, these are these these are these are posing questions. See, that's why I want to ask the question. See, if I was to ask you, are you a Christian? Now you're thinking, well. Yes, but I want to qualify it. I, I want to make sure you understand when I say I'm a, I'm a Christian, I want you to know what it is I believe that I'm saying. I'm a Christian, yes, and I believe, but... Well, that's where we're going to camp out for the rest of the afternoon. Is, is right here. Do you know the word Christian, I told, I told you this last time, is only found three times in all of the Word of God? Three times in all the Word of God, the whole Bible. And every time it's used, it's used derogatory. It wasn't, a, the word Christian is, wasn't a, a good word. The word Christian, it'd be like today you calling somebody a geek. Oh, look at him, he's a geek. Or they're a dork. Or I don't know what they say in Hong Kong, so I'm trying to come up with, you know, what do they, what do they call nerds? Nerds? Yeah, well, that guy's a nerd. You know, they're uncool. They're they're unpopular. You know, he's not a he's not a, not a cool dude. And well, this is what the word Christian really was. It, it was really what had happened is is that the word Christian is first found in the book of Acts. Jesus had left. Uh, 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 he had risen, went to be at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Persecution had broke out in in the church at Jerusalem. It was scattered abroad, and some of them went into what is known today as modern-day Turkey, into a city called Antioch, and they started telling the believers, uh, or the, the, the people that, the, the believers that were scattered abroad, started telling the people in Antioch what God had done in Jerusalem, how He had raised Jesus from from the dead and many of them begin to believe and and the church was being birthed and the news of this got back to Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to go check it out and when Barnabas got there they found this great revival so Barnabas went to Tarshish to look for Saul in Acts 11 verse 25 he says then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul and when he found him he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers. Now, now you got to realize he's teaching Jews and Greeks and Gentiles all alike of great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. 
This was a label that somebody else. Have you ever had been in a conversation with somebody and then they're talking and somebody walks up and they go, oh, you're, they're Christian. They're Christian. <laughs> they're Christian. Like, like, like somehow you ought to stop what you're doing because they're a Christian. <laughs> uh oh, here comes those Christians. <laughs> oh, my God. Put the beers away. Here comes the Christians. <laughs> Change the music. Here comes the Christians. Well, this is this is this is kind of what they're they're talking about there. They didn't call themselves that. This is what they, they called themselves disciples. Now the word disciple has a definition to it. See, the word Christian was 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 a derogatory term. It had no definition to it. See, the word disciple had a definition. It means that he was a disciplined learner. He was a pupil or you were a follower of. You, you imitated what your master did. When we look up the word Christian, we don't find much definition. But you look up the word disciple, you find all kinds of definitions. And, it, and if you want to be a disciple, then it's really easy to open up the word of God and to figure out what it is that God wants you to do with your life. A disciple is different than a Christian. It's, it's, see, it's pretty tough to define Christian. Define Christian. Well, we say, well, it's a Christ call. Well, this is years later. This isn't something that Jesus called his followers. This, this is hundreds of years down the road. Now, now they're called, excuse me. Now, now they're called Christians by people that are not part of the group. The people in the city in Antioch would look and say, oh, those are those Christians. Look at that. Look how they look. Look at them. Christians. And, and, and it was used in a, in a derogatory manner, in a derogatory term, but they called themselves Disciple. So if I was to ask you this afternoon, if you were a Christian, probably 99% of the people sitting in this body of believers here today would say, yes, I'm a Christian. But what if I was to change it up just a little bit and ask you, are you a disciple? Are you a disciplined learner, a pupil? A follower of. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or are you just a Christian? Well, well wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute, Master. I mean, I, I, I believe. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, but, but, you know, I got a life too. You know, I mean, do you really like just expect me to lay everything aside and go and follow Jesus with my life? I mean, I got a job, I got kids, I got a wife, I got a husband. I, you know, I, I've got, I've got responsibilities, right? Let's see what Jesus' last words were before he departed. In John, the thirteenth chapter, verse thirty-three, he says, "My children, I will be with you only a little longer." You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, now, all of a sudden, Peter, Peter, if you know the story here, Peter perks up. It's like, well, wait a minute, Lord. We're disciples. Where you go, we go. I mean, this is how we roll, man. We're, we're part of the band. You, know, you, you can't go. I mean, if you're going there, we're, we're going there. That's what we're going to do. And I can almost hear Peter going... Does Andrew get to go, Lord? Does and, is, if, if, if Andrew's going, then I sure I'm not the only one going to be left here, right? Because Peter always had a problem with what everybody else was doing. <laughs> you ever met Peter? <laughs> he's he's a pretty familiar character. Verse thirty-four, Jesus says this: "A new command I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another." That's it. That's it. Now, if you want to define Christianity, what a Christian is, I want to give it to you right here. He says, listen, a new command I'm going to give you. Fellas, these are some of the last words that I'm going to speak to you before I leave. 
I want these to be the most important things you hear out of my mouth. I want you, as my followers, I want you to love one another the same way I have loved you. Now we're going to get down to what Christianity is. Now we're going to get down to what being a disciple and a father. I want you to, I want you to love people the same way I do. Do you remember when I loved you unconditionally? Remember where you were? Remember what you were doing? When did he love us? Oh yeah, when we were sinners. When we were sinners. When we were far away from him. He reached, he left heaven, came to earth, reached into our world, left the light, ran into the darkness so he could get you and bring you into the light. He says, now, that love, that love that touched you, now I want you to take that love and I want you to reach out and touch others with that kind of same love. That's a little hard if you're one of those Christians who want to run around judging everybody that's living in sin, isn't it? It's kind of, it's kind of hard running around. That, that's more pharmaceutical, isn't it? Remember the Pharisees? They walked around. Righteous pomp. <laughs> they looked at Jesus and what they say. We talked about it last time I was here. He hangs out with sinners. Look at the kind of people he keeps company with. If he would have known what manner of woman that was, he would have never been close to her. But Jesus was always hanging out with people that were lost so he could drag them out of the darkness and into the light. At our church at home, we have a drug and alcohol program. It's our outreach. And you know what we do? We reach out to drug addicts, alcoholics, and we bring them into the body, usually through the court system. They've usually sat in front of a judge, and a judge says, "You can." our program is called Jacob's Ladder. And the judge will say, ma'am, you may go to jail, or you may go to Jacob's Ladder. What would you like to do? And it's amazing how they're ready to pray. Oh, I'm just ready to change my life, Your Honor. If I could go to Jacob's Ladder, it would be so great. Instead of going to jail. Good, the judge said. And then they come to us. Hi, uh, the court sent me here. And for 13 weeks, they're ours. For 13 weeks. You know what we do? We beat them up. We... No, we don't. We love them. And they come in, they're mad. Sometimes for weeks. For the, sometimes for the first two or three weeks they'll come in. They, you just see them. They'll check in. They have to check in at the door and they come in and they just... We'll be talking about the love of God and good things God's got for us. <laughs> but after a while, after a little while, you're not. <laughs> about a month ago, this guy walked in, big heart guy, big muscles, tattoos everywhere, just, you know, mean as a. An owl, you know, just me. You know, it was just, you know. And he'd been coming for about three weeks. And I remember looking at him. And I looked at him. His name's Michael. I said, hey, Michael. It's getting on you, isn't it, buddy? He goes, what do you mean? Just like a hard guy, man. What do you mean? I go, this whole love of God thing is starting to, starting to penetrate, isn't it? 
He goes, man, you're freaking me out. He walked out. He walked outside. I think he went outside and had a cigarette or something, you know. He's walking back in, and I'm looking at him. I'm going, <laughs> and for 13 weeks they come. And you know what our job is to do? My job is not to judge them. My job is not to beat them up. My job is I have a new commandment that I give unto you, that you, the church, my representatives, the ones that claim to follow me, that you would go love them with the same love that I loved you with. Oh. <laughs> but Lord, look what they're doing. They're sinners. And so is you. Yeah. So is you. I can, I, I can hear him say, Matthew? Matthew? Yeah, Levi? The tax collector, Matthew? Yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember where you were when I found you? Yes, Lord. Yes. I was a traitor Jew collecting taxes for the Roman government. That's right. That's right. And I loved you, didn't I? Did I love you? I, I, I invited you to come and follow us and be a part of the family? Yes, Lord, you, you did. And I can picture Jesus going, Peter, you remember how you treated Matthew? <laughs> Oh, come on, Lord, that's not fair. Matthew was a tax collector at the time, right? Peter, you remember how you treated Matthew? Uh, yes, Lord, but I've grown a lot since then. Do you, can you get it? John, John, do you remember where we went after I invited Matthew in? He, yes, Lord, we, we went to Matthew, Matthew's house. And what we do, John, you remember? Well, we met with all of his tax collector friends. <laughs> doing stuff we shouldn't have been doing, I guess. Remember the Pharisees? Do you remember the story? They stood outside the house. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, the traitor Jew, that they were collecting taxes from the Jews to give to the Romans. How could Jesus... The one that calls himself the Messiah, be inside the house of a tax collector. There's sinners in there. Sinners and tax collectors together. How can that be? Matthew, you remember the love that I loved you with? Yes, Lord. The new commandment I'm going to give to you. Now that same love, I want you to go give to others. Sometimes we've been in church too long. Sometimes we meet in these little places called churches. And we think that this is what God wants to do. No, no, no. This is just a celebration of what God wants to do. You know what God wants to do? See, He wants to bring all kinds of people. All kinds of people. Who's the visitors here? <laughs> I know, buddy. God bless me. <laughs> so, man, you just put the heat on all kinds of people, man. To, like, to judge them, to make them feel... No, man. I'm glad you're here. That's not what this is about. This is about a reunion. See, this is about family. This is, this is about giving us a chance to show you how much God loves you. How much He cares about your life. What He wants to do on the inside. Don't you understand that? See, that's what Christianity right. is. is giving away the love that God gave us to give it away to other human beings. Do you know what kind of love that, 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 that does? Do you know what kind of love it takes to forgive a thief on a cross? The guy's a thief. They didn't hang ordinary thieves. This guy was a habitual criminal. Ordinary thieves, they would just cause them to be slaves. 
on Roman slave ships and stuff like that. They only hung, crucified, the thieves that were habitual. They, like, man, this guy has been stealing stuff his whole life. We're going to have to kill him. And there he is on a cross next to Jesus. And he looks to Jesus. He says, Lord, would you remember me? And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's done. How can that happen? He hasn't been confirmed or baptized. <laughs> they write. You know what Jesus is wanting them to see? He wanted them to see how much he loved them so they could have a chance, a small chance at taking that love and giving it away to somebody else. What, what, kind, of, what kind of love? Who, who would walk away from that kind of love? Who could, who could resist that kind of love? He, he wanted them to display that love one to another so the world would look and go, ah, oh, so that's how husbands are supposed to treat their wives. Huh, I've never seen that. That's how wives are supposed to treat their husbands. This is how rich people are supposed to treat poor people. This is how, this is, this is how we treat the widows. This is what we do. It's an opportunity for us to show God's love. And I could go on and on. The story of the prodigal would break every parent's heart. There's not a parent in this place that hasn't felt the sting of a prodigal child. And sometimes we think, well, if I would have been a better parent, if I would have only got him in Sunday school earlier, if I would have just, you know, not let him hung out with Billy Bob, <laughs> then it would have been okay. None of those things are true. God was a good parent, and even his kids went bad. See, because we have free will. We have moral agency here. And see, what this does is this, this allows us, and it gives us the opportunity to share with the world Something the world can't imagine. Could you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen in this world? Could you imagine in Hong Kong if people started loving one another the way that God loved us? Could you imagine what would happen in a church if a church starts loving one another unconditionally? I'm going to love you not based on how you treat me, but I'm going to love you based on how He treated me. I'm going to give away God's love to you. You know what happens? When that happens, churches begin to grow. Because you know what? People can't resist that kind of love. People go, man, you know what? I was a dope fiend, and they loved me. I was strung out, or I was messed up, or I was, I was broken. I was, I was a psychopath. And they kept loving me. And one day, they loved me long enough for that love to penetrate that hard, hard mind. See, that's what happened to me. They invited me to a church. Do I look like I was raised in church to you? <laughs> I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know nothing about church. And all I knew is we went into church, and somebody said, grab your neighbor's hand. I said, I ain't grabbing that dude's hand, man. That ain't going to happen. And I remember standing there thinking, wow, this is a weird place. They started singing songs, you know. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time. And they started getting away. And I'm looking around and going, well, dear God, man, this is like a bad acid trip. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? I love a God. I love a God. Just get it. coming through. Okay, you got to shut up, don't you? <laughs> you know what? Wouldn't it be crazy if we just started loving one another? How about how about if we don't do nothing else in the Bible? How, how about if we don't do nothing else except for do this? A new command. I'm going to give you. 
that you love one another the same way I loved you. It wasn't because you earned my favor. It wasn't like one day Howard got good and got on his best clothes and went to Sunday school. Okay, now I love you. On my worst day, he reached out and says, Hey, dude, I love you. I'm on your side. I want you to make it. I don't want you to stay broken. I don't want you to stay dysfunctional. I want to make you a part of my body. This, this crazy thing called the church, where God gets a preacher inspired with his word, and like every Sunday we come into these little groups, and, he, and the preacher preaches, and as he's preaching, then I, God, the Holy Spirit, begin to work in your heart, and I'll begin to change you. And those things that are broken, I'll begin to heal. I'll begin to fix. Could you imagine how a church could change? Could you imagine how your home would change? Could you imagine if husbands and wives begin to love one another unconditionally? If you're a follower of Jesus this week, I want to challenge you. Let me just close with a challenge. If you're a follower of Jesus, I know your wife is a wreck. I know that your husband's a mess. I know that your teenagers are all spun out. I realize that you know you're surrounded by idiots and <laughs> everybody's an idiot but you. You're the only balanced person you know. I got it. I got it. But what if for the next week? You didn't take your cues on how you treated them from how they were acting. How about if you take your cues of how you treat them from God and how He treated you? I want you to love them with the same love that I loved you with. Do you know how radically that will change your home? Do you know how radically that will change a family? Your future, your destiny, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I just want to say, I want to, I want to say to you, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry that the church has given you such a jacked up picture of what God really wanted us to be. I met so many Christians that run around and judge me, got on their pulpit, shook their finger, their Bible. <laughs> That never moved me. See, for somebody to run up to me and tell me I was on my way to hell, that didn't bother me. I'd usually look at him and say, I hope you didn't have to pray very long about that, because I could have told you that without even praying about it. <laughs> I knew I was broken. I knew I was messed up. But when somebody started loving on me, saying, you know what, Howard, God's got a plan for you. I didn't know how to handle that. Man, has God got something for you? Yeah, you you you, you know that little hardness that you got that you know you think you're the little hard guy and you're gonna be the little gangster dude. Man, I'm gonna turn that around and I'm gonna use that boldness. Something that's gonna change the world. And I just wanna say if you're here today and you've got a, a picture or an image of the church. That's that. I want to say I'm sorry. Because that's not what the church is. It's never what the church is meant to be. You know what the reality is? is we're, we're all on, on common ground. You know, the thing, you, know, you know, the thing that people hate about the church, or hate about me, when I say me, it's not me personally. I'm, me as a preacher. Have you ever heard people talk about preachers? Oh, that guy's preaching. You know, preachers, preachers, preachers. All they want is money, 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 money. That's what the preacher, the preacher is about. It. It is, it's, you know what they hate about the church? It's, it's. You know what? I'd never go to that. You know why? There's a bunch of hypocrites down there. Hypocrites. I'm telling you, hypocrites. That's why I don't go. Well, there's hypocrites on the planet, and you're not jumping off. The, the question is, is, isn't whether or not there's hypocrites. The real question is, is whether or not you're going to be one. Are you going to be one? Are you going to be a vessel? Are you... 
that's God, tell him I want to talk. <laughs> I'm ready. See, there's something about the church that's powerful, and I'll just close with this. It's, see, as a preacher, I don't want to have to coerce you to give your life to Christ. That isn't, that, that, I will never do that. I would rather you walk out of here as a stone cold faced sinner and know where you're at. But you know, you know, you know what happens when you come in places where you feel the love of God? You're not coerced. It's not like, okay, bow your head. All right, now listen, God's dealing with you. Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I see that hand. You know you're here. You filthy sinner. You know who I'm talking to right now. I, I put a mirror right on top of your head back there. You know, and finally they, they get you to do that and you raise your hand. Then once it, then the preacher says, okay, now you raise your hand. Look at me. Now look at me. If you really, did you really mean that? You know? <laughs> Come on down here. You know, then you're going to crawl to the altar. You know? <laughs> Some of you have known that, huh? <laughs> I can tell by your response. That's not, I'm talking about being drawn. I'm not talking about being coerced. I'm talking about something on the inside. <laughs> something inside of here. That when you're in this mix, it's like, God, I want some of that. I don't know what it is, thank God. But whatever that is, I need some of that on the inside of my life. See, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking. I felt guilty several times, but I didn't feel condemned. Sometimes I'd get around people that were Christian, and I'd see how they treat one another. I would see their relationships, and I think, man, I would love to have some of that. I would love to have some of that on the inside of my life. But I didn't know where to get it until I came to the cross. Until I stopped and said, you know what, Jesus? That is what I need on the inside of my life. And the day that I did that, my whole life changed. What's a Christian? Right there. A new command I give to you to do what? And go to church three times a week and read your... No. <laughs> See, we put all the lists to it. We put all the lists. He says, begin to love one another. Begin to love one another. It's the same way that I've loved you. And you know what? You'll change the world. Love will change the world. Let me read. Can I, can I read another scripture? Sure. Yeah. And I hate long-winded preachers. <laughs> <laughs> What's my last scripture? Yeah, put that up. Dear friends, let us love one another. Now, this is John. He's, he's not a young man no more. He's not a young disciple. He, remember when he, when he first started following the Lord, he was just a young teenager, all excited, you know, street preaching and getting run out of town. And out. Now he's an old man, and he's writing these letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And, and he says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from where? From God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love amongst us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might through Him. That this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank You. But you knew where to find me I was hungry, you were bred